Director of Toxicology and Food Safety for Remkus Consulting. As I mentioned in the very uh, earlier today, uh, Remkus has some great information on its website uh, for you guys in terms of continuing education programs, webinars, papers, et cetera. And um, also, don't forget, they're your go-to resource for litigation support. And uh, Carla is front and center uh, from that perspective. So we're, we're lucky to have her. And she's going to talk to us today and, and follow up on a tremendous uh, TED style talk that she did on testing for food contamination, which for the QSR and the uh, limited service style restaurants is always a big issue. We get these claims frequently. And Carl, I know you've got a lot of experience in this space, I think over 30 years worth. So we're lucky to have you joining us today. So welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So um, I, your TED Talk was terrific. People, if you didn't get a chance to see that yet, I strongly encourage you to. Some great information. Carla, what's, what's the most frequent type of claim that, that you typically get involved in? We, we know you get involved in beer, but that's probably because you like it. But what, what are, what's the most frequent? It, there's always something in somebody's food. We, we get a lot of um, like fast, well, not really fast food, but typically they're a fast food or kind of semi-fast food restaurant that um, they'll find, or there, there's an alleged animal, uh, rat, a lot of rodents, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, or like a, um, the example I gave, which was a screw, some piece of material. Yeah. Uh, and those, and we can um, we can identify that material and see if it was a material. Sometimes it's actually you'd expect it as something normal in food processing. For example, if it's a a, a small piece of bone in a hamburger, the question is you know, would you expect that in there? Well, yeah, you would. It could happen. And then as compared to a, a screw, and then you're like, well, yeah, that's not supposed to be. Yeah, that takes so, you back to law school. We had the the uh, reasonable expectation, right? The natural test, uh, you know, would you reasonably expect it to be in there? And I think the the, the, the example one of my professors used was rocks and beans uh because when you're doing those refried beans you know you're sorting you know thousands and thousands of beans and sometimes rocks get in there but that's when people call you in right to say what would reasonably be expected uh, to be found right but you go on and i want to dive deeper or i want you to dive deeper into uh some of the more uh very cool science initiatives and evolution that has come along that you talked about, like the, the saliva tests, and maybe perhaps you can uh, talk a little bit more about that and some of the other things that you've seen in your career that have really evolved. Sure. So one of the things that have evolved in the past that's really exciting uh, is using the whole genome sequence salmonella. And what that does is back in the day, we used to just say, oh yeah, you have, and uh, that's, all, that's all we have. The more we understood more about these, these microorganisms, the more we understand how different each one is. And it allows us at, to, in the trace back to look for that specific one because of, there's so many different strains of, of salmonella and, and it's not just, uh, one type of one, you know, substrain or, or species or of different types of salmonella. It's the actual genome that can can vary. And what's also amazing, the research in this area is um, if we have enough information, and many times we don't, but in some of these really large cases, we can. Um, they're gaining more and more information. More resources are putting uh, are being put into by the CDC and many of the other federal agencies to do whole genome sequencing on everyone is, uh, involved. And what they've been able to do in the research is actually show how the genome changes over time. So there's a potential for you to at one point say, all right, I've got this type of salmonella today. Where did it come from? Well, it evolved from the same type of salmonella that's commonly found in, in beef or in pigs or in this, right? Or in chicken. Or chicken. Another real thing you've been able to see. We're also, with salmonella, 
we're, with the data we have now, we're able to show that certain group, certain types of salmonella will will um, be more prevalent in say um, like in chickens versus um, versus cows. That they they tend to, to to grow there as and also another thing people don't talk about too much are you know your turtles and your amphibians. Uh, turtles are a great source of salmonella. Um, and people love to handle their turtles and not wash their hands. And we, oh. we've seen outbreaks that are associated with turtles. And uh, so that that's something that's come about. And people are not everybody quite understands a lot of the sources that how the how many sources there are for salmonella in the environment. Well, well piggybacking kind of on this sal- salmonella concept, are, what what's the best practices for preventing that type of outbreak at a restaurant today? Of course, adhere to all the FEMSA regulations with regard to cleaning, um, record keeping. Now, when we talk about protecting yourself, we're talking about when when something bad and something bad will happen. I mean, there's going to be, if you've got a restaurant for a certain period of time, you're going to have someone to come that will come up to you and say, you know, your food made me sick or had an issue. And records, you say, well, I adhere, no, we adhere to our, our cleaning policy, training, training those individuals. Yeah, we train them every period, you know, every three months or, or whatever. And here is our document that shows that the health, um, you know, the local health department has reviewed us and we've got this great record. Or it's just like, it's not that great a record, but, you know, all we did was forget to, you know, put the fire extinguisher um, near the door instead of under, you know, someplace else. So it's... Um, understanding your record keeping, making sure you do keep those records and have policies in place, especially for some of these fast food restaurants, policies in place in order to, um, to, to maintain and keep those records, have the software, have, have, have it available and have the training. The other thing is um, when, again, training your, your employees say, you know, we hope we, this doesn't happen, but it will over a period of time, you know, in five years, you're going to have a, a few people that aren't going to like go to find something. And um, that manager or even the employee at that point, maybe it's at 10 o'clock at night and the main manager is out, you know, taking the, 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 the money to the bank or whatever, and they're not there. Make sure everyone knows what to do when there's a complaint. You know, take that food, wrap it up and put it in the freezer and have that written as a standard operating procedure that you can go back to. And um, then that's something that people are like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I get cleaning every time and I, and I, I know where to go to tell me how to clean. But but that record keeping part is it's hard. It's tedious or it can be hard. It's tedious. But you but if you train people early on to just that's what you do, that's what you do. And um, it's going to pay off tremendously in the end. Yeah, it's, it's clear. Uh, I, I think that's a very good point about it's one thing to practice reasonable care, but you have to be able to demonstrate it, right? You've got to be able to prove it when the time comes. And, and you talk about that, you know, in your TED Talk, I remember that you spoke about the need for an evidentiary trail, right, of the, tra- of the policies, of the training. And I think that's very crucial. And clearly, you give some examples you know, in, in this line of uh, potential risk. So yeah, that's, that's good stuff for sure. So the, the salmonella thing there, so you mentioned the genome thing a minute ago and you talk about how it, it changes and there's different aspects and I'm not a scientist, so I'm butchering the description, but to, to kind of bring it home and, and have it make sense for lay people like me, is that similar to what we think about when we think about a different strain of COVID? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, you know that the as COVID develops, it, it picks up, it goes from person to person to person. It um, has the potential to, to change. And what w- the way COVID works is that um, there's certain, or pretty much any virus or bacteria, there's certain areas of the genome that is susceptible to change, those small changes. 
And with um, COVID or any type of vaccine, what they do, they try to predict where those, those changes are and what common changes would occur um, based on their research. And that's how they, that's one of the tools that is, is employed into some of the vaccine work to try to help understand what they, you know, to kind of be um, protected against not just what's going on right now or one, at one strain, but as many as possible, if possible. So. That's that's good to know. And that, that yeah, that's interesting. David, I know you've got a question. Do you want to just jump on or do you want me to ask it for you? Oh, here he comes. Sorry. So, yeah, t when you're live, typing doesn't make sense. So, in these instances where somebody makes a makes an accusation or a claim um, in the restaurant for an object, someone spit in my food, etc., we would prefer to have chain of custody. But we've technically sold that food item to that guest, and the it's the guest's property. So, we would like as the restaurant to retain that chain of the chain of custody of that. So. My, my guess is that you think that's a good idea, but secondarily, and perhaps more importantly, what is the best practice for keeping that food item? Most of the time we see it labeled in the walk-in as do not throw away, you know, <laughs> um, and it ultimately disappears or, I mean, ultimately has gonna get to a lab, but but is there a better, is there a better solution than just putting it in the walk-in with a <coughs> Yeah. I'll take my in answer fact, off <laughs> In fact, um, some, for some of our analysis, freezing is not a good idea. Um, and so, uh, so what we suggest is putting them in the refrigerator until you understand a little bit more about what you're going to test for. Unfortunately, there is a time frame that you you can't keep it in the refrigerator for too long. You do, you need to either do something with it, i.e., get it tested, or to have to freeze it. Um, so the guy, what I suggest is, you know, again, have the policy of, and, and have someone in line um, at your restaurant or in your organization that takes those calls and has, you know, a, a, their, their consultant, right, uh, you know, on speed dial say, hey, you know, Dr. Kinslow, you know, this is my situation. What do I do with this piece of hot dog? Um, it's got spit on it. Okay, spit. We, you know, let's go ahead and wrap it up because we also have to, you talk about maintain the chain of custody. We also have to help you understand where to send it and how, how to send it. Um, if um, there's circumstances where, for example, with Rimkus, we will have a local consultant go in, you have a, a nice clean chain of custody to us, then we package it and then we send it off and then a nice, nice um, uh, clean chain of custody out so that we know we've taken it and we've sent it as compared to, hey, Bob, you know, send it over to whatever lab and Bob or Susie or whoever that is, and they get something wrong. Okay, so we prefer to have a chain, a, a chain of custody showing that a, a trained personnel has sent it out um, and to, to the analysis. Um, and it helps uh, take the stress, quite frankly, off of many of your local managers um, to say, Call this, this call this company. They'll come out in the next few, you know, tomorrow. Typically, it's you know, it's not an emergency. Um, the where it gets kind of sticky is when people say, "Oh, you know, I, I broke my tooth and I want my tooth out of there." <laughs> and and you know, most people are really nice. I'm like, well, of course, it's your it's your hot dog. I sold it to you. You can have your tooth. Um, and that's where photographs can help. Uh, and to know, you know what, what the shape of the tooth because I've had, I've had cases where they said they lost one tooth and then later on they said you know they lost another tooth. <laughs> <laughs> that one was a quick one. That was easy. I like those. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, David. That's a great question. And feel free to jump in anytime because I know you know a lot about this space. But Carla, what about the? Uh, incubation period on some of these cases. Uh, can you clarify that a little bit? You know, because we, we do get a lot of food poisoning claims. Can you talk to make sure the audience understands what we're talking about there? And, and it, food poisoning is, uh, well, let's, let's start with that. Let's, let's talk about the incubation period. Sure. 
Remember I told you that there's a lot of different strains of uh, salmonella, and in those strains, there's a lot of different, what they're called, uh, serotypes within that strain. And then we got this whole genome thing. So we got all these layers of understanding exactly what kind of organism um, is in, that has been infected someone or that's in our food. Now, what we, um, what's interesting is, from, well, um, from my point, standpoint, sorry, uh, but is that these organisms have different abilities to, 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 uh, to survive really harsh conditions. So there's certain salmonella strains that can survive very high temperatures. Um, so for example, when we talk about heating your chili up to X number of degrees for X number of minutes, you need to do that. And there's a reason to make sure you catch even some of those really heat tolerant types of salmonella. Um, salmonella can also, this is something that I, I do leafy greens cases quite often. And salmonella can actually grow and, and stay inside a piece of lettuce cell, the cell. Oh, wow. Okay? Salmonella can, is, has been found on the seeds of certain um, um, green leafy uh, vegetables or different vegetables. Salmonella can be on, in the soil. It's a soil microbe. Um, if you've got a, um, a, a, um, a irrigation system, See what's upstream from that irrigation system, okay? Um, sometimes there's there's an animal feedlot that's very close. Oh, wow. um, keep track um, if you're that. So so when we talk about where salmonella can come from, okay? So that's one aspect, right? Uh, it's a it's a useful organism. And the other thing, because many times we get tied up in you know this this handling from one one group to another group to another group and trying to trace it back to that specific produce, producer. And remember the CDC has a different goal in mind than most of us. And so sometimes the, get, the data is not kept or is not gathered at the time when they're doing, the CDC is doing a trace back. Um, so there's many times there's gaps there that would truly trace it back with a high level of confidence to some, to one specific location. Um, and so that's information that we can go through and, and try to understand how that traceback was done. Now let's talk about, um, you mentioned the illness. Salmonella, um, depending on the individual, salmonella can cause illness within, say, hours, a, couple, a few hours or so, and, or a few days. And then we don't know, there's not a specific, okay, if one person gets 10, you know, salmonella uh, organisms in them, then they will, you know, it'll take five days before you start seeing symptoms. It's not like that. We, unfortunately, it's really not um, a, a value that we can say that person absolutely will get sick and this person will not. So there's not a, a threshold, specific threshold. We do have some ranges. But it's not, but typically we don't have enumeration of how much um, uh, salmonella was on that hamburger or could have been. Another thing, salmonella can actually um, harbor within and be dormant within some a person's gut. So if I go through someone's medical records and let's say that they had a history at, within a certain period of time of having salmonella, it would be worthwhile to, to consider that possibility that they could maintain a, a dormant amount of salmonella in their gut that then became active later on. Um, medical records are very, very important here. Um, and I, as I mentioned or alluded to in my, my, um, my presentation, that those organisms, um, we, the medical records help us understand a true definite diagnosis of that organ, um, that specific salmonella and that strain. Typically, down to the strain level. They rarely go into the whole genome sequencing or the um, level, but sometimes you'll get a serotype from um, the medical records. And that will help you understand if there's a, a causal link. That's interesting. So there's really not a definitive incubation period, as you pointed out, right? It, it could several hours to several days, potentially. But I mean, it's not, it's not three minutes and it's not 
you know, 20 days, right? 25 days. Right. But so what we do is if you look at um, an outbreak, you have a, a time frame and you have, it's like a bell curve, right? You have an increase of illnesses over time, and then it break, and then they recognize that there's an issue, they mit- mitigate it, and then those those trail off. There's a basal level of of people out there that are getting salmonella on a daily basis, and every time you get a, a pathogen, such as salmonella or E. coli infection, and it's documented in the medical records, then that is automatically reported to the CDC. So it's it's, it's do- there's a documented amount of this out there. And so if you look at the so people in the peak, many times you know, it's pretty, that one, uh, you know, we recognize that there's an out. But if these, these people over here in the fringes are the ones that we sit back and kind of look at first to see if there is, um, you know, is that part of the background or is that part of that outbreak? Or if we had, especially if we have an outbreaks right next to each other. So. When you mention when you mention outbreaks, um, is it plausible for one customer at a restaurant to get food poisoning and there not be any other cases? So there's, it depends on the circumstances. So you know, there's plausible, and then there's you're starting a you're starting to sound just like a lawyer now, Carla. That's good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> right now without any documentation with the possible okay, okay. yes yeah. it is and um and we as, as toxicologists microbiologists we look at that at each in, individual infection independently okay uh, until we know more of the context um it is a good piece of information to know um if there are several people that were ill and the other thing is uh, to know where those people were. There's a difference between you you throw a, a a birthday party and that was, you know, the whole group was at one restaurant or one location and then moved to your restaurant onto another place, gone, and all those people got sick. As you know, you can almost look at that as, um, as one individual, right? Because you don't know if that group, you know, was, was everywhere. And that's, that's one thing that we do look at. If we do see a group, like where were all those individual people before and after? Um, as to, you know, you have a restaurant and just everyone gets sick from all these different random places and they all go home afterwards and it's, there's not a link. So that's another thing to think about as far as when you, when we talk about outbreaks, um, where they were before and how they're grouped and how they're related together or, or not. Very helpful. I have a, a just a quick question. I just popped into my mind. Does a microwave kill salmonella? If it gets up high enough temperature. Oh, so just because if I've got a commercial microwave in my kitchen in my restaurant and I pop the chili in there for, you know, say a minute and a half, what, what, what's the probability that it's, it's going to kill everything in there? Of course, it's going to kill the nutrients, I know, right? But what about, what, what about potential uh, infection virals? It's, it's got to be at a certain temperature. Yes. It wow. Has to be, you got to temperature for a long enough period of time. And that's, uh, that's all in the food regs. Right. But how? Ha- how would somebody know if their particular, and I'm just showing you that I don't really understand it, but how would somebody know their particular microwave in a commercial kitchen is going to get to a particular temperature? They have thermometers. Um, that they most, would use, most, yeah. Yeah. Most restaurants have, um, in fact, like if you got a really large food, uh, like a cafeteria where they're cooking numerous hamburgers, Typically, what they'll do is they'll go and they'll take, they record the, the temperature of each hamburger. You know, they have 20 or 30 out there. They will record, and they should record the temperature of a random number so that that's in there. And then, of course, if you want a, a certain type of hamburger that's not fully cooked, then, you know, a, some chefs say, oh, you push here, but typically they take a temperature of it. Okay, good to know. I want to I, I want to be mindful of our time. Does anybody have any questions that's on? And because I've got one more question I'd like to ask, but I want to save time for anybody else. 
Carla, in your talk, you, you, your TED talk, you, nope, somebody say something. Okay, I don't think so. Carla, and you, you mentioned THC contamination. And, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that's going to just be a growing challenge. And are you seeing it done uh, kind of viciously by an employee uh, contaminating food products in the workplace, kind of as a retaliation or getting even? Or are you seeing it uh, perhaps both? where we're actually creating dishes with THC, uh, you know, where it's legal and people are trying it and they just become overcome or, or, or both, both types of episodes occurring? Well, the, the example I gave is, you know, we didn't get into, I don't think it was anything that was, nothing in the, the file indicated that it was malicious. Let me okay. put that away. I mean, was my understanding was, Thought it was kind of cool, and <laughs> and and, um, and it wasn't hard to find them, so it wasn't like they did it and ran off. Um, but I don't know, uh, so it was part of the record that I, I didn't get into. The other, so as far as doing something maliciously or negatively with um, THC, I that's the only case that I've ever had that would you know okay. indicate that there there is several examples of anecdotal information where people have tried to, um, you know, they've added it to food, they've experimented it with food, um, or they simply ordered uh, like a candy bar and they didn't look at the serving size and they, they ate too much. That, um, in around 2016 is when they, and California was one of the, the first states that required you to put a serving size and the amount of THC that's in an edible. And before that, you didn't know. Um, and in fact, before that, they didn't really have like childproof containers. Now they're much better about regulatorily requiring that you put THC in something that children can't get into like you would medicine. And, and they're doing much better with their labeling. Um, but still, it, there, you see an increase in accidental um, doses of THC. When it comes to say the the restaurant industry, there is a growing industry where, um, and I was part of a, a presentation a couple of years ago, where they, you know, you have a bed and breakfast, and the bed and breakfast, their whole marketing issue or the the, the, the what they're marketing is here, come and relax and have you know smoke your pot and you know on site and we'll sell it to you and you're good. Um, so it's type of a vacation. People from out of town can come. It, it was much more popular before all the states started to get on the bandwagon and, and legalize marijuana. Um, but uh, right now we're seeing where people are understanding a little bit more about the dosing and they're, they're doing a little bit more research and the research is out there. But, we, but that doesn't negate accidental or accidental overdose of THC in, in the population right now. Very insightful. Thank you. Fascinating information. We're out of time. We could keep talking for a long time, but we're going to have you back to talk about beer sometime. So uh, 